Good morning, Eddie. And I are missing giving you our weekly inspiration. So what we thought we'd do is we would share the things that we've been reading this week and um, read a little bit from our favourites. Now, Miss Teague recommended this one to me, Cowgirl. Um, that one's by G.R. Gemin. Um, and I have read it in two days and I absolutely love that one really really happy story um with some nice bits of friendship in there as well so give that one a go if um you like a little bit of feel good um fiction it's um it's a quick read as well but the one i'm getting my teeth into now and that's year seven i shared this with some of you is the night gardener now this one is by jonathan oxier um that's spelled a u x i e uh, and it's very, very much like Neil Gaiman. So that's a really good one um, if you like that kind of story. So I'm going to read you the blurb um, and then I will read you the opening and then you can let me know what you think if you choose it from the e-library or download it onto your um, devices or order it from Amazon, whatever you do. Um, I'd love to know what you think. The Night Gardener follows two abandoned Irish siblings who travel to work as servants at a creepy, crumbling English manor house. But the house and its inhabitants are not quite what they seem. Soon, the children are confronted by a mysterious stranger and by an ancient curse that threatens their very lives. Yes, it's lovely as well, because if you have a look, it's got some lovely lovely illustration so part one is called arrivals chapter one storyteller at the crossroads the calendar said early march but the smell in the air said late october a crisp sun shone over cedar hollow melting the final bits of ice from the bare trees steam rose from the soil like a phantom carrying with it a whisper of autumn smoke that had been lying dormant in the frosty underground Squinting through the trees, you could just make out the winding path that ran from the village all the way to the woods in the south. People seldom travelled in that direction, but on this March morning that felt like October, a horse and cart rattled down the road. It was a fish cart with a broken back wheel and no fish. Riding atop the bench were two children, a girl and a boy, both with striking red hair. The girl was named Molly, and the boy, her brother, was Kip. And they were riding to their deaths. This, at least, was what Molly had been told by no fewer than a dozen people as they travelled from farm to farm in search of the Windsor estate. Every person they spoke to muttered something ominous about sour woods, and then refused to tell them more. The Windsors? said one shepherd, whom Molly had stopped in the road. I'd soon as lead my flock to a lion's den. He propped himself against his crook, eyeing Molly from heel to head the way that people sometimes did. Be that as it may, Molly said in her most polite voice, it's where we need to be. The Windsors were expecting us last week. Then they can wait a little longer. The man summoned up some phlegm from his throat and spat on the ground. <coughs> My advice, go back to whatever country you came from. The Sour Woods is no place for anyone. He shuffled across the road and into the trees, a trail of bleating sheep behind him. Molly sighed. That was the third shepherd that hour. What do you think they mean by the Sour Woods? Kip said when the flock had passed and they were moving again. Molly did not know, and so she made something up. You don't know about a sour wood, she said, pretending to be astonished. Why, it's a whole forest of nothing but lemon trees and lemon blossoms and lemon moss and lemon wheats. They say that when summer comes and the fruit is ripe, just breathing the air will make your whole face pucker. She said things like this to let her brother know she wasn't worried. But she was worried. 
She and Kip had been riding almost non-stop for four days through rain and cold, led by a horse that barely tolerated them, due in part to the fact that Molly did not know the creature's nature. She had told her brother it was Galileo, but the horse seemed to disagree. She had somehow imagined that English roads would be broad and level, but these roads were even worse than those back home. The mud was black and greedy, holding on to whatever touched it, and included their back wheel, which had lost three spokes only the day before. What little food there had been in the back of the cart had long since been eaten, and now only rancid fish remained. Are you cold? she asked, noticing her brother shiver under his coat. He shook his head, which she could now see was damp and hot. Molly's heart fell. Kip had been sick for weeks and showed little sign of getting better. He needed clean clothes. He needed a bed and a bath and a proper meal. He needed a home. Kip stifled a cough against his sleeve. Maybe all these folks is right, he said. Maybe we should turn back to town or go back home. Molly couldn't allow herself to wish for that. She and Kip were an ocean away from the place they called home. She put her hand on his forehead, which was warm. Dear, you talk. A person think my diaries to pay of cutters. We'll find a place soon enough, direction or not. And there'll be hot food and a warm bed and honest work. They rode on, growing ever more lost, until mid-afternoon, when they came across something unexpected. First they heard her song, a sonorous drone that crept around the bend. The music became louder as they approached, and they could soon make out a voice singing. It was an old woman, not much taller than Kip, seated in the middle of the crossroads, singing to herself. The woman was clearly some sort of vagrant, for she carried on her shoulders a huge pack bound with twine. The pack contained a clutter of random objects, hats, blankets, lamps, as well as more interesting things like books, bird cages, and lightning rods. It reminded Molly of a snail's shell. The woman was hunched over a strange instrument, almost the size of her body. The instrument had a crank at one end, and when she turned the handle, deep notes came out that Molly thought might be what it sounded like if honeybees could sing. Molly slowed the cart and observed the woman from a safe distance. She was singing about an old man and a tree. Her voice was surprisingly sweet. Molly had seen beggars playing instruments like this before in the market at home. A hurdy-gurdy, they called it. Do you think she's a witch? Kip whispered to his sister. Molly smiled. If that's a witch, she ain't much of one. Hardly a wart on her. Only one way to know for sure, though. She flicked the reins and the horse moved a little closer. Pardon me, ma'am, she called out to the woman. My brother would like to know if you're a witch or not.